It has been 35 days since Caitlin Armstrong was apprehended by U.S. Marshals after allegedly fatally shooting Mo Wilson back on May 11th and fleeing the country. Now, on July 20th, Armstrong was in court for the first time and made a motion for a speedy trial. The state argued against that motion, saying in order to have a speedy trial for her would be allowing her to cut the line, so to speak, in front of other criminal defendants who've been waiting years to have their cases heard. Well, ultimately, the judge decided to side with the defense on that issue and scheduled her trial date for October 20th. Now, today, we learned that as Texas prosecutors are preparing to head to trial in a couple months, they've also sent a subpoena to get Caitlin Armstrong's medical records. According to our friends at the Austin Chronicle, an application for subpoena obtained by the Chronicle uh, is showing that the state is looking into Armstrong's hospital records. Now, this includes uh, emergency room records, EMS reports, blood tests, CT scans, and blood alcohol content from St. Joseph Medical Center in Houston back on July the 2nd, which would be three days after Armstrong was arrested in Costa Rica. There you see the language in that subpoena there now on your screen. And we want to bring in a very special guest tonight to help us break down this brand new information. Maggie Thompson is on the program tonight. She is a reporter with the Austin Chronicle. She is a journalist who wrote about these very latest developments in Caitlin Armstrong's case. Uh, Maggie, so good to see you. Thank you so much for making time for us tonight. Thank you. Let's begin with um, some big things uh, you reveal in, in your reporting. And one of them that I find to be uh, the most interesting is kind of the, the theory of this case. We're sort of getting a hint at where Caitlin Armstrong's defense attorney may go uh, through watching him and your reporting on all the hearings. Uh, what impression are you left with in terms of what he's going to do to defend her at trial, please? Sure. So, I mean, he has said that he is he is suspecting Colin Strickland of involvement here. He says that there is a vandalism report um, at their home that they lived in together that we haven't heard enough about. Um, we've requested those records and have not seen a separate vandalism report. If there is some kind of evidence of vandalism, that would be under the umbrella of this murder investigation, which the city is very tight lipped about right now. Right, Maggie. Boy, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. it's really fascinating because we know Colin Strickland is uncharged here, uh, but it's my understanding in reading through uh, some of the affidavits in support of of arrest and search in connection to this case that uh, the Sig Sauer handgun um, that was allegedly used to carry out this crime um, was found at his place and the spent casings match, but investigators are not suspecting Colin Strickland of being the trigger man. Um, although he may have purchased that firearm for Caitlin Armstrong uh, because the two of them were involved for so many years. Uh, mm -hmm. Any more details you have on that point, please, Maggie? Yes. Yeah, so just yesterday, the district attorney's office here in Austin uh, filed another application for subpoena for um, records from an Austin gun store. And uh, so it's unclear, we don't have that application yet, so we don't know exactly what they're looking for, but it seems like they might, there might be another gun involved here, or, or are they looking at this particular um, purchase? We don't know. Right, Maggie. Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I appreciate that. That's certainly one aspect of this to watch uh, with the firearms because we know uh, that Mo Wilson mm -hmm. was shot to death. Um, so that was the method. And as part of the arrest warrant, uh, police are alleging uh, this was Caitlin Armstrong's gun and that the spent casings match. And so that's a big link for them. Um, we'll stand by uh, for those uh, results. In the meantime, some other mm -hmm. subpoenas you've been reporting on. So to get the medical records, uh, if we can talk about that, the prosecutor's office wants Caitlin Armstrong's records from after she was arrested. What do you make of that, please, mm -hmm. Maggie? So looking at this, my first question was, is this standard when somebody's extradited from Costa Rica to the US, are they gonna get the full works done in a hospital? No, it's not, US Marshals answered today. This is not normal. They said the kind of situation where this might happen, that somebody goes to the hospital before being um, booked, it would be because they have some kind of injury that requires 
yeah, CAT scans, the kind of things that we're seeing that district, the district attorney's office is obviously interested in, or potentially if somebody comes into jail and says that they've used drugs recently in the last few hours, that's another situation where they might send somebody to the hospital. Um, it's really interesting though, because the application for subpoena also says surgical records. It's possible that she had a surgery. Um, they have lab results. They're listing so many different things on here. So uh, unclear if this is kind of a spaghetti at the wall approach or if, you know, where they got this tip from. Right, right, Maggie. Yeah, they, they could be fishing or, or maybe, as noted in this photograph, many people are speculating that uh, she might have had a little rhinoplasty while she was on the run yeah. there. And maybe that's what they're looking at uh, with the surgical record request, as you pointed out. Uh, again, we're going to stand yeah. by uh, for those results. Uh, Maggie, I know you've been present uh, at, at that pretrial hearing uh, where the defense was making that motion for the speedy trial. And we want to go back and play a statement where when the hearing was over, defense counsel, uh, this is back on July the 20th, um, spoke outside of court uh, to the media. Here's a little listen at what they had to say. I'll say just a few words today because I do understand that there's intense media interest in Caitlin Armstrong's case. I know that you'll have a lot of questions and there will be a time and a place to answer those questions, but not today. There's a big picture here. This is a beginning of a process that will play out in court and it should play out in court. And we understand that there are questions that need to be answered and we look forward to doing so. But we also have some questions of our own. What you saw in that courtroom today was illuminating. Ms. Armstrong wants her day in court. She wants a trial. And you heard the district attorney threaten sanctions over her desire for a trial. As a matter of course, cases should not be indicted if prosecutors are not prepared to proceed. But we have some questions. Why did the Austin Police Department seemingly ignore a tip about the former boyfriend of Miss Wilson? Why did the Austin Police Department present inaccurate and misleading information to a judge when seeking an arrest warrant of Miss Armstrong? Did the inexperience of two key officers assigned to this case play a role in its apparent mishandling? Who vandalized the home of Caitlin Armstrong and Colin Strickland the night of Wilson's death, and why. Unfortunately, a lot of the information that's been presented so far in the media is simply not accurate. I understand that reporters frequently will get information from so-called law enforcement sources. The police have a vested interest in paying a picture that supports their initial assumptions and actions. Law enforcement sources also might have an interest and glossing over details that could be of interest in relatable to their mistakes in the initial hours of this unfortunate situation, terrible situation. All I can ask of the press here is that you not consider everything told to you by law enforcement as confirmed and reportable facts. Simply put, there is a lot more to this story than has yet been heard. We will file motions challenging this investigation and challenging the conduct of the Austin Police Department. We look forward to this legal process ahead and these issues being heard in a court of law. All right, so that was Caitlin Armstrong's lead counsel, attorney Rick Coffer, leading that uh, short little, I guess you could call it a press conference uh, after that July 20th hearing. Maggie Thompson, uh, tell me, you work in the Austin area, so you perhaps may have heard of his reputation. What, if anything, do you know mm -hmm. about Rick Coffer uh, as an attorney? Is he well known in the city? Uh, yes, he is. He has a long history. He's actually won awards from uh, voters who vote at our paper for the best of Austin best lawyer. So he's wow. very well known. 
in and well respected in the area. Oh wow, okay. Uh, so he's well known. Um, and how about the judge? I saw in your reporting that the judge is getting set to retire soon after a very long career mm -hmm. serving on the bench. I think he wrote about 35 years. Um, anything uh, noteworthy mm -hmm. about this judge uh, getting assigned this case that you can think of? Uh, I, not that I know of. It is interesting. She is set to retire in December. Uh, the trial is set to begin in October. That doesn't seem like a lot of time. These things definitely can be uh, pushed down the road. So yeah, it's interesting, but I don't know what it means. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point, because would it get assigned to another judge? Let's say one side has really good mm -hmm. reason to postpone. Uh, that's an excellent point. Right. Is there anything else? You are so invested in the story and have followed it so closely, Maggie. Anything um, that really sticks out in your mind is, is a big question here um, to this love triangle, the mystery. Anything really jumping out at you as we're sitting here tonight examining um, much mm -hmm. of the evidence, but we certainly don't know all of, of the details. I think the thing that I hear people talking about in Austin the most is the kind of intrigue of her escape and the network of support that it seems that you would need to to make this kind of escape work she ended up she had a, a false passport allegations of that that she potentially had plastic surgery we know kind of her flight path um all of these things i think you know what we hear a lot of in austin is just how how did she get all these people to help her who are these people? And if she did it on her own, how? Um, I think that that is, is kind of the most, in some ways, the most shocking part of this case. I agree with you, Maggie. And that's definitely something we're going to be asking our investigators who are joining us uh, in, in just a short while on the program tonight. Could she have done all of this without any help? Um, I know they would know far better than I would, uh, but that's an excellent point to end on. We hope to talk with you again. Maggie Thompson, again, with the Austin Chronicle. Thank you so much for coming on the program tonight.